If it's Monday, tragedy in Louisville after a gunman opens fire inside a local bank, killing four and injuring at least eight more as another community reels after yet another mass shooting in America. Plus, the Justice Department weighs in after two federal judges issue dueling rulings on abortion access, leaving the fate of a widely used abortion pill hanging in the balance. And NBC News obtains dozens of leaked Pentagon documents, many of them marked with the highest level of classification as the Justice Department opens a criminal investigation into what could be the most serious breach of U.S. intelligence secrets in a decade. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We begin with breaking news tied to yet another mass shooting, this time at a bank in downtown Louisville. Police just wrapped up a briefing on their investigation. They say the 23-year-old gunman identified as Connor Sturgeon opened fire with a rifle in the bank where he worked, killing four and wounding nine others, including multiple police officers, before being killed himself in a shootout with police this morning. One of those officers injured had literally just been sworn in days ago. I just want to let everyone know that the officer who is in critical condition today, Officer Nicholas Wilt, 26 years of age, just graduated from the police academy on March 31st. I just swore him in and his family was there to witness his journey to become a police officer. He was struck in the head, engaged in this incident. Nick has come out of brain surgery and is in critical but stable condition as we speak. In a statement, the president noted that once again, the nation is mourning another senseless act of gun violence. And as he has done after multiple mass shootings in recent weeks, Mr. Biden again called on Congress to pass tougher gun laws. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir has been on the ground in Louisville since shortly after the shooting took place. He got emotional this morning talking about his personal connection to what transpired. Take a listen to what he had to say. This is awful. I have a very close friend that didn't make it today. And I have another close friend who didn't either, and one who's at the hospital that I hope is, is going to make it through. I hope every one of those bank employees and folks in that building, one that I know well, and my AG campaign was out of that building. I know virtually everyone in it. That's my bank. I hope that they will all reach out and get the help that they need. There have now been at least 146 mass shootings in this country in 2023. That's according to the Gun Violence Archive. This is the 100th day of this year. NBC's Morgan Chesky joins me now live from Louisville. Morgan, it's hard to believe that we are talking about yet another mass shooting. What's the latest on the investigation? What are police saying about the shooter? Yeah, Kristen, this was a very telling and emotional nearly 45 minute press conference where we heard from the governor, from the mayor, from investigators and from those very doctors who treated those uh, nine victims taken to area hospitals following this gunman's shooting spree. Uh, we do know the names now of those four individuals who were killed as a result of this shooting. I'd like to share them with you now. They've been identified as 64 year old James Tut, 40 year old Joshua Barrick. Juliana Farmer as well, and Thomas Elliott. Uh, Thomas Elliott is a 63-year-old uh, that Governor Bashir has identified as being a close friend, an individual whom he credited with helping him get his legal career up and running. The governor growing uh, emotional both this morning and a short time ago uh, in describing this loss. Chris, he said the one thing this community needs right now is love because these families face such a long road ahead uh, amid such unspeakable loss. Now, as for this gunman who's been identified as 23-year-old Connor Sturgeon Kristen, we do know that he was carrying some sort of long rifle in, but authorities are not identifying any specific make or model at this time. However, they did say that during these moments of the shooting, Kristen, some of it was live streamed onto social media. Mm. They didn't specify which platform, uh, but they did say that going forward, the investigation will certainly take a hard look at that and what exactly was shared and with whom and for how long. Uh, you can only imagine the nightmare 
uh, of someone witnessing mm. the carnage inside this old National Bank building. We did ask if there was any security measures in place inside the building. Investigators say right now all of that is being gathered as they've established a wide perimeter uh, as investigators work their way in to gather evidence, hopefully learn more uh, about how exactly this took place. There has been no motive given at this time, Kristen. Investigators have only said that they believe Sturgeon uh, was a c current or former employee of the bank and that he was 23 years old. Mm. We do know that um, he was believed to have been a Louisville resident. Mm. And according to the chief, when I asked her if they had any knowledge of him as to having a criminal record with the police department here, she said they had not received any specific calls for this 23-year-old man who was killed at the scene by police. Kristen, we're told they arrived within just about three minutes of the first calls going out, they credit that incredibly fast response time with saving more lives in that building. We've had a chance to hear throughout the day from some of those inside uh, describing just a harrowing, harrowing terrifying ordeal uh, as that gun would open fire. Kristen? Oh, absolutely, and our thoughts are with the entire Louisville community as that investigation just gets underway. We appreciate you're giving us all of that information and an update on the victims' names. That is certainly where our focus should be in those nine people who were wounded. Morgan Chesky, thank you so very much. We will, of course, continue to bring you updates as we get them on that shooting. We do want to turn now to the latest fallout surrounding an issue with enormous political and legal ramifications in America. Abortion access. Once again, the issue could be heading for the Supreme Court after two federal judges issued two conflicting rulings on access to common medication abortion drug. This afternoon, the Department of Justice filed a motion asking an appeals court to halt Friday's ruling by a federal judge in Texas that would block access to the drug Mifepristone nationwide. In a victory for anti-abortion advocates, that judge suspended the FDA's longstanding approval of the pill. The drug is part of a two-step regimen used to terminate pregnancies up to 10 weeks. If the appeals court rejects the DOJ's request for a stay, the ruling would go into effect on Saturday. This morning, Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra said he's confident the administration will prevail. We're going to defend this through the legal process every step of the way. We, we believe, we're very confident that we will prevail because it's not just access to Vimperpristone, which millions of Americans have used over those 20 years, which is made available in more than 60 countries worldwide. It's because we want to protect Vimperpristone, we want to protect insulin, we want to protect all those life-saving drugs that Americans rely on because they are safe and effective, because FDA went through a process to make sure they were. Just to give a little bit more context here, medication abortions account for half of all abortions in the U.S. Today, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre echoed Becerra's confidence and reiterated President Biden's commitment to abortion rights. The Department of Justice were quick to act, as you know, that, as you mentioned, the stay, and uh, and we're going to continue to move forward in that fashion. Uh, it probably is going to go up to the Supreme Court, which we feel pretty confident that we're going to uh, win. This is a president and an administration that's going to continue to fight, uh, continue to fight to make sure that women have the health care that they need to make sure that they make their own decision when it comes to, to their uh, uh, when it comes to their own body. Complicating all of this is another ruling handed down from a federal judge in Washington, also on Friday, protecting access to Mifepristone. That ruling applies to the 17 states plus the District of Columbia, which brought the case. The patchwork of conflicting rulings comes as the abortion issue remains a political live wire for Republicans. Just last week, it cost conservatives the key seat on Wisconsin's Supreme Court, where the liberal candidate notched a double-digit victory over her opponent. Joining me now, NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett, who will be with us in just a moment. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. NBC News health policy reporter Chloe Atkins and Dr. Bivak Kumar, a Texas-based abortion provider. Thanks to all of you for being here. Chloe, let me start with you because the DOJ has just essentially taken action to try to block the Texas court ruling. What can you tell us? That's right, Kristen. So, you know, all this came down on Friday, on Good Friday, 
Friday out of all days. And what we saw is two conflicting orders from judge from judges. One judge in Texas saying or asking for the suspension of Mifepristone. Um, and then the other one in Washington state, um, you know, reserving the status quo of access to Mifepristone in 17 Democratic led states. And so there is a lot of uncertainty and conflicting um, orders on what access could look like. And what it really boils down to is that this is an evolving situation and that in the next seven days we will really be able to have a better understanding and even the FDA on guidance on how they plan to distribute or dispense this medication um, throughout the nation if they are allowed to do so or it's only in those 17 other states. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it will probably likely come down to a higher court being able to sift through this and really define what access looks like nationwide, Kristen. Uh, Chloe, thank you for that. Laura, let me turn to you. Give us your take on the action that we saw by the DOJ today. What is the significance and where could it lead? Well, there have been some question about whether they would actually skip over the Fifth Circuit and go straight to the Supreme Court, given the stakes here. I think there had been some concern about whether the Fifth Circuit would drag its feet and issue an order in time. Given really the seven-day time period we were talking about this week, um, where the judge's order in Texas um, doesn't go into effect right away, they gave that time for the Justice Department to appeal. And so there, I think there had been some concern about whether the Fifth Circuit would rule fast enough. And now that they have filed the appeal, they make it very clear they want the court to move fast so that if in fact the Fifth Circuit doesn't give DOJ what it wants it still has time to get to the Supreme Court before this order goes into effect on Saturday Kristen and Laura let's talk big picture here because you have the Texas ruling which essentially halts the use of mifepristone and then right. the Washington State ruling which contradicts that in 17 states undoubtedly this is headed for the Supreme Court. What's the timing? When do you think we could see it go to the high court? And when do you think we could have a final decision here? Well, it partly depends on what happens in the Fifth Circuit. Now that DOJ and Danco, the manufacturer of this pill, have filed their appeal, what you might see at, in a first instance is what's known as an administrative stay. And all that means is that the Fifth Circuit is putting a pause on everything. It would wipe out Judge Kaczmarek's um, Saturday deadline, in effect, to allow everyone to have their say Everyone would file their motion papers in court, and then the case would proceed. But essentially, it would maintain the status quo, and so you don't have that looming deadline over you. If, in fact, the Fifth Circuit puts that stay in place, then that would slow things down a bit. Obviously, the plaintiffs would fight it, but it could potentially slow things down a bit. If, in fact, the Fifth Circuit does not do that, then I think you're going to see some very quick movement to the Supreme Court very soon this week, probably as early as Wednesday or Thursday, Kristen. And Laura, can you break down right now where we are? Where does access stand if you wanted to try to purchase this pill? Well, right now, it, you, it's really just the sta status quo as if everything uh, was in existence on Friday afternoon. So if you live in a state um, where access to Mifepristone um, was, was already granted and there was no other rule on the books, then that continues. The interesting thing to note here is that the Washington state case, which that federal judge issued, only applies to those 18 blue states because those are the ones that sued over it. Their Democratic AGs sued over it, almost a mirror image to to the Texas lawsuit. They were so worried about the Texas lawsuit, that's why they did it. But that case doesn't include some of the biggest states. That case doesn't include New York or California. So if you're a woman in New York or California, you would presumably be governed by the Texas suit, whereas a woman in Illinois would be governed by the, the lawsuit in Washington. And so it's sort of a patchwork and, and a bit of a uh, a bit of a mess for people trying to figure out which rule applies to them and hence again why this is, could be headed to the Supreme Court quickly. Mm. Laura, thank you for helping us sort through what is such a complicated legal situation. Monica, let me go to you at the White House because the administration has already had to clarify what Javier Becerra said earlier today, making it very clear that they will not simply ignore the ruling from the, high, from, uh, the Texas court. But how far can the White House go? Take me inside some of your conversations. What are they saying? 
Yeah, and this is something that the Health and Human Services Secretary, Javier Becerra, said yesterday on the Sunday shows. He said, quote, everything is on the table. And it came in the context of some high-profile Democrats saying that the White House should come out and fully ignore this potential ban on this crucial medication for terminating pregnancy. And instead, the White House essentially had to ask HHS and others to walk back that language when it comes to the administration specifically. Of course, of course, lawmakers can have their own opinions here, and many of those Democrats do, and they diverge with what we just heard from the White House press secretary, who I asked about all of this. And she said, to be very clear, the White House and President Biden don't want to set a precedent of saying we're not going to obey or listen to something that would be a binding order. They don't want to go down that path. So they are saying they, of course, intend to fight this. That has been their position since this ruling came out on Friday. But they're going to do so, they say, in the legal system and in the courts. And so that does set up this larger conversation about the strategy here. And that is why in conversations with officials today, we continue to hear a White House that is bracing, they say, for a very long legal battle. So even though they would support essentially the Department of Justice, if it does make that decision, as Laura was reporting, to go to the Supreme Court sooner in this process while on the separate track trying to get it blocked in the Fifth Circuit, they're also not necessarily saying that that's something they want to see happen immediately. They think this could really take a long time. But Karine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, when asked, said she actually has confidence that if this went to the Supreme Court, they would win. When asked why she has that kind of confidence, given the conservative-leaning majority currently uh, in the Supreme Court, she said simply that she believes the facts of this case are on their side, specifically from the perspective of the FDA and what this would mean for plenty of other very common drugs and medications that Americans take every day, that that agency agency has deemed safe and effective. Kristen. Great job pressing her today, Monica, to get those answers and that clarification. Chloe, let me ask you one more. Are there other legal cases on medication abortion that are pending that could add to this patchwork that we're tracking? Definitely. There are two other um, cases that are going on right now, one out of West Virginia and North Carolina that really center on um, restrictions and the dispensing of medication abortion. But I do want to harp on the fact that the two cases that we are seeing play out right this moment is the Texas and the Washington state case. And that those two are really the focal point and will soon really define what access looks like for this crucial drug. And I really want to, you know, bring up the facts in this, that this drug has been on the market for 20 something years. It's been used by millions of people and it's highly effective and highly safe. And if this drug is taken off the market in the coming days. At the end of this week, we will see providers um, pivot to this misoprostol only regimen that is um, just as safe, but slightly less effective, Kristen. Okay. Chloe and Laura and Monica, thank you so very much for starting us off. Dr. Kumar, that takes us nicely to you uh, because I think a lot of people are wondering how this impacts doctors. How does this ruling impact the decisions that you and your colleagues are making right now? Yeah, this ruling is another example of political interference. I think for those of us that provide abortion care, unfortunately, it's become common for politicians and judges to insert themselves in the decisions and the conversations that I have with my patients. Rather than these things being private between me and my patients, we now have to think about what a court has said, what medication is still available, what's not available. And it's a real intrusion into our ability to provide health care for people. And what kind of questions are you fielding from your patients and are you able to provide this pill to people or are you in a holding pattern? Yeah, I mean, I'm in Texas. And so, you know, there are 18 states that have uh, some kind of a, a ban on abortion or where it's completely illegal. So in Texas, we're not able to provide this care for anybody. Uh, folks are still able to travel out of state. And that's what's been happening. When we ban abortion, it doesn't stop the need for it. So rather than accessing that care here in Texas, folks are going to other states. It's important for people to know, even with these decisions that came down on Friday, that Mifepristone is still available in the states that it was available before. People can still access it online as well through telehealth uh, platforms. And so it's important for people to know that the medication is still available. It remains safe and extremely effective. Um, of course, this can change in the next few days or in the next few weeks, depending on how things um, go through the court system. But right now, it is still accessible and available. Dr. Kumar, can you break down the reality of taking the two-pill course 
versus one, because there is still one pill that you can take based on everything that I have read. It doesn't have the high level of efficacy as taking the two pills. And there is the risk of more side effects, right? Exactly. So with the two medications, the mifepristone followed by the misoprostol, it is extremely safe, extremely effective. And most people have very few side effects, definitely very few serious side effects, if any. With misoprostol alone, it is the regimen that's used in many countries throughout the world. It is extremely safe and also effective, just slightly less so. And when we think about the landscape in this country, I mentioned there are 18 states that have a ban on abortion. Uh, we're talking about a lot of people uh, medication abortion is also what accounts for the majority of people who are having an abortion in this country. About 53% of abortions um, are d completed with uh, medications. And so we're talking about a lot of people. And we will begin to see people that maybe need additional support or additional help uh, to complete their abortion. We're also talking about people that are traveling, sometimes hundreds or thousands of miles. And so it really will cause chaos in, in the access landscape as people uh, get care that they need. Folks are sometimes also hesitant or scared, especially if they're in a state where abortion is illegal, about what they can say to their healthcare provider, where they can go for that care. And so it really is uh, definitely unprecedented, but also scary to think about what could happen when we are taking away options uh, for people. Um, and mifepristone has been FDA approved for over 20 years. It's the mainstay of medication abortion in this country. So we're really looking at an unprecedented landscape and it's really unfortunate because people will have less options. I want to follow up with you on that. I mean, you talk about the hundreds of miles that some women have to travel to get the care they are seeking. What is the burden that's being placed on women who need this care? Yeah, the burden is huge. I mean, we continue to see people who are trying to travel, the logistics that are involved in finding a health center in another state, the logistics involved in traveling, oftentimes they have kids already, so they're looking for childcare, taking time off of work, making that trip hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. Um, and many people are also not able to make that journey. And they tell us whether they're undocumented, whether logistically it's impossible. Sometimes they're forced to stay pregnant against their will, and it's really unfortunate. Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for all of your information. We really appreciate it. Coming up, what we know and still don't know about that major breach of U.S. intelligence secret that has defense officials and America's allies on edge. The latest from the Pentagon next. Plus, I plan on running. President Biden gives NBC's Al Roker his most candid comments yet on his 2024 plans. We've got new reporting on when to expect an official announcement ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. At this point, do you believe the leak is contained? Are there more documents out there that have not been released publicly? Is this an ongoing threat? We don't know. We truly don't know. Welcome back. That was NSC spokesperson John Kirby at the White House today addressing the dozens of classified Pentagon documents that were leaked in what could be one of the most serious breaches of U.S. intelligence in a decade. NBC News has now obtained more than 50 of those leaked documents, many of them labeled top secret. The documents, which started to appear online last month, include assessments of Ukraine's combat capabilities, estimates of Russian troop casualties, as well as intelligence gathered on U.S. allies, including Israel and South Korea. A senior U.S. official tells NBC News the government's working theory is that the documents they have been leaked so far are real, though some may have been altered. Joining me now to discuss this is NBC News global security reporter Dan DeLuce and justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Dan, let me start with you. How much more do we know about where these documents are from and the source of this intel? Well, I think that was a pretty straight answer we, we heard from John Kirby from the White House. Uh, they don't know. But if you look at the documents, they uh, seem to be slides, uh, you know, briefs for the joint staff, for the U.S. military leadership. But they're citing information from a whole range of intelligence agencies, including the CIA, including uh, the National Reconnaissance Office that oversees spy satellites, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and on and on. There are photos, there are satellite imagery of, of, of battlefield damage <coughs> from strikes. Uh, there are maps. And then, of course, there is a lot of reference to signals intelligence, electronic spying and eavesdropping. 
very sensitive and something the U.S. does not advertise. And so that's also uh, of huge concern. But exactly how this got out there, uh, there's no clear answer. Mm. Ken, what are your sources telling you? Do we have any sense about how they got online? So they don't know the answer to that question, but Bellingcat, the open source intelligence agency, has done an analysis and they found that one of the first places they appeared was this chat room on this social media platform called Discord. It was a chat room devoted to the Minecraft game, believe it or not. Mm. And so, and it, apparently they were sitting there in plain sight for weeks before journalists or the U.S. government knew they were there. And then finally last week reporters figured it out and started writing about it. But it's, it's so that's one of the great mysteries of this. And, and it's sort of suggest that maybe this wasn't, say, a Russian spying operation, because why would they want to post that online? Well, so that takes me to my next question, Ken. Do we have a sense of whether this was a hack or a, an internal government leak? No and sense. Which is worse? Yeah, they, exactly. They, They're yeah. all bad scenarios. A hack is horrible. An accident, somebody leaving yeah. a briefcase somewhere, a leak or a Russian spying operation. They're all bad. But one thing is clear is that uh, this information, a lot of it is incredibly sensitive, as Dan was saying. And, it, you know, even though it's not in terms of the volume, it's not close to, say, the Edward Snowden or the WikiLeaks disclosures of a decade ago. In terms of the freshness of the intelligence and some of the specificity of it in terms of like air defenses in Ukraine and stuff, I've never seen information like this in mm. public. Dan, given everything that you and Ken are saying, what is the Pentagon saying about this? How are officials there responding? How much concern is there? Uh, there's clearly concern. There was a briefing earlier off camera and a Pentagon spokesperson, spokesperson said this was a top priority. They are taking it very seriously. They've set up a team to try to assess the damage that's been done, the impact of this. They believe that the documents appear to contain sensitive and highly classified information. And they say they're trying to get to the bottom of it. And they're also looking at taking measures to mitigate the effect of this. But uh, they were very limited in what they could say. They wouldn't say who's even in charge of this assessment, this review. And they wouldn't discuss specifics of any of these documents. They did say that Defense Secretary Austin well, learned of this last Thursday. And of course, Ken was just saying that these were out there lurking online for weeks. Dan, are there any key takeaways that we are learning from these documents that have stood out to you? You know, there are several. I, I think one is the extent that the U.S. was able to pen is able to penetrate ru the Russian military mm -hmm. and the Russian government. There's a lot of spying here going on that the Russians would not be pleased about. But there's also uh, spying that goes on against the Ukrainians. And uh, sometimes the U.S. seems to be struggling to figure out what the Ukrainians' plans are. But I think one worrying uh, inf piece of information that's come out is Ukraine's struggle with its air defenses. The Russians are wearing down mm. all those air defenses. And there's uh, two documents that paint a pretty grim picture saying that they could literally run out of some of these munitions by May. Ken, whenever we talk about classified information, we talk about the concern over compromising sources and methods. Mm. How much concern is there that this could actually be putting people's lives at risk? Well, there, there wasn't a lot of reference to human sources in here, so that's the good news. So maybe not lives at risk, but when, as Dan was saying earlier, when you talk about signals intelligence, that is the crown jewels of the mm. U.S. intelligence community. Like 70% of the president's daily intelligence brief comes from that. And so anytime that's discussed publicly, it allows the adversary to reverse engineer and then shut down those avenues of intelligence. So that really gives the IC heartburn, the intelligence community heartburn when, when that is exposed. So that may be the real damage mm. here, Kristen. Speaking of heartburn, how are our allies responding to this? So there's these revelations, of course, that we spy on our allies too, which yes. is not a secret in Washington, <laughs> but when it becomes public, it's embarrassing right. and then they have to take action. It's sort of a wink and a nod. They know that we spy on them, but when it becomes public and it's in their face, it's embarrassing for both sides. Dan, what's your take in terms of what the impact could be with some of the United States' most important but thorniest most complicated relationships. Right. I think it's very awkward, uh, obviously, when you're caught uh, like this spying. Uh, South Korea has already publicly said they will demand measures be taken. Israel was very vehement in their language, saying this was completely incorrect. This alleged intel uh, report that said that Mossad was telling its staff to, to protest. I think the most awkward 
bit about this, though, is with the Ukrainians. Mm. They're in a, a life and death struggle there. And any information leaking out that exposes their positions or their combat power is, is bad news for them. And so I think this will be a very uncomfortable conversation with the Ukrainians. Well, we appreciate uh, all of your great reporting, both of you, NBC's Dan DeLuce and Ken Delanian. Really appreciate it. Up next, what President Biden just told NBC News about his reelection plans and what it means for the president, the politics, and the 2024 race. You're watching Meet the Press now. Are you saying that, uh, that you would be uh, taking part in uh, our upcoming election in 2024? Well, I'll either, so I'll either, I'll either be rolling egg or you know, being the, the, good, you know, the guy who's pushing them out. Come on, help a, bro <laughs> help a brother out. Make no, some news no, for no, me no. here. Well, I, I plan on running now, but we're not prepared to announce it yet. Welcome back. That was President Biden talking about his 2024 plans to our new chief White House correspondent, Al Roker, this morning at the White House ahead of the annual Easter egg roll. Al did an incredible job. That answer essentially confirms NBC's latest reporting that the final touches are being put on the president's reelection operation. But with no expected primary challenger and the oxygen on the Republican side being sucked up by former President Trump's legal issues, there's really little urgency at the White House to set a launch date. Top Biden ally, Congressman Jim Clyburn, tells NBC, quote, the longer Biden can go without being an announced candidate, the better off he is. Joining me now on set is Nicholas Wu, congressional reporter for Politico, Democratic strategist and NBC News political analyst Juanita Tolliver, and Sarah Chamberlain, president and CEO of the Republican Main Street Partnership. Thank you so much to all of you for being here to start us off on this very busy Monday. Nicholas, uh, let me start with you. First of all, what did you make of the president's comments there? It sounds like he's made up his mind, but we know he's not in a rush. He doesn't really need to be, right? Well, we got some news out of the Easter egg roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Always I think, the best days. Exactly. <laughs> but I think the interesting thing here is is quite how much Biden really is biding, biding his time uh, before announcing his reelection. I mean... Right now, he can just sit back and do the work of governing while, you know, you see, while there are all these negative headlines about Trump in the news, his legal woes, and, you know, all the other Republicans do getting out. Whereas, you know, Biden, you know, he, at the end of the day, he's the incumbent, right? Like, yes, there are certain fundraising deadlines that he'll need to deal with if he wants to run for, when he event, if it makes it official for reelection. But, like, you know, he can still draw on an incredibly large network and all the advantages of incumbency. Juanita, a source close to the president said that one reason he's holding off on announcing is to, quote, preserve the option not to run. Do you think that makes Democrats a little nervous? No, I'm just going to roll my eyes at that. Like, let's be real. <laughs> Biden is building his 2024 campaign team. Honestly, I thought the soft launch of his campaign was the State of the Union back in mm -hmm. February. Mm -hmm. We heard the phrase, finish the job. That's what he intends to do. So I'm just going to dismiss that. I'm not nervous by it. But what I do think <laughs> is that he is enjoying the luxury of being a strong incumbent, as Nick said, right? Like, he's going out talking about all the things he's achieved legislatively, all the businesses or all the investments he's making in communities across the country. He's sending out his cabinet to do the same. And so they're going to keep doing that for as long as they You're can. right. It's such a soft launch. Sarah, what do you make of this? And from Republicans' perspective, you have former President Trump really sucking up all of the oxygen. There's really no urgency for Ron DeSantis to get right. in or even former Vice President Pence right now. I think you're going to see everything get pushed back closer mm -hmm. to uh, to the summertime, which usually doesn't happen. And Biden does have the luxury of time, though I'm not sure the Democrats really want him. Uh, <laughs> all the latest polling, you know, it's like 50 percent. So it's going to be an interesting time. But I think you're going to see people jumping in in June, June you know, or July. Yeah, this this week is so interesting. I think we actually have that polling um, that you're talking about. Let's look at that. Um, the idea that Democrats are just not that enthusiastic about a second Biden run. 54 percent, Nicholas, say they want to see another candidate. I mean, is he going to be getting off to a weak start no matter when he announces? Well, from every Democrat I've talked to, the, the consensus is that, yes, you know, the Maybe another person could be better at some point, but right now there is no other choice other than, you know, say, relatively fringe candidates like Marianne Williamson, right? Democrats see Biden as the incumbent, and if he officially declares, they will unite behind him. That that that's just kind of the way it is right now. You know, it's interesting. Chuck made a point that this week could be a consequential one in the mm -hmm. 2024 mm -hmm. race. 
because, or last week, I should say, you had former President Trump's indictment. You had the two dueling rulings on abortion yes. in Texas and Washington state. A and then you have the two lawmakers who were expelled in Tennessee. Juanita, do you think it's overstated to say that this past week could be pivotal? Let's be real, this past week drained me. <laughs> <laughs> It is showing the impact of inflection points. It's showing that younger voices are standing up and being active in, in ways that I think older generations aren't prepared for, thus the expulsion of two black people out of Tennessee's state house. It shows that uh, the public is more in tuned and supportive of these charges against Trump. I think that number even went up by five points in the last seven days with people believing he took illegal action. It also shows that people want people to fight for their rights in these abortion rulings with Mifepristone. And so when Biden is on the right side of that and Republicans across the country are repeatedly trying to enforce more and more bans, that's going to make it explicitly clear, just like it did in Wisconsin, where Janet Protasse was won by 11 points in a state that Biden only won by less than one point in 2020. Uh, that was yeah, a big turnout for the Huge. down in Madison. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about out. the abortion issue and the Tennessee issue. I want to play you what uh, Texas Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez had to say and then get your reaction on the other side. I think it's important that we take care of women and we, we it's important that we have real discussions on women's health care and, and get off the abortion, get off the, you know, the abortion conversation. Uh, women have a whole lot more other issues than just abortion. And let's have those real conversations and let's talk about, you know, let's talk about the other things that are happening in, in this world. Sarah, what do you make of that strategy? Clearly what you are seeing is an attempt to figure out how to deal with mm -hmm. this issue that continues to appear to be a liability for Republicans. Sure does, and it would be no surprise that I actually agree with Tony, know him very well. <laughs> is that uh, realistic though, to get off of the issue of abortion? Well, we need to talk about women's health care, mm -hmm. and we need to change the abortion to women's health care, and we need to address that. And as Republicans, until we do that, we're going to see what's going on in Wisconsin and some other places. I have great faith we will. We will pivot and we'll start talking about it. Nicholas, what are, what are your sources telling you? I mean, clearly, Republicans are scrambling to try to figure out how to message this moment. You hear what Sarah says. You hear what Congressman Gonzalez just said. Is this realistic that people are going to start to try to shift the conversation in that way? It's something that Republicans have been trying to do for some mm -hmm. time. Right? Trying to pivot away towards the economy or any other sort of different, any other set of issues. But you know, Democrats saw this as a very potent line of attack uh, in the last midterm elections. And you know, as my colleague and I reported today, they're preparing to continue to make this an issue into this week. Right? Democrats are. Uh, House Democrats and Senate Democrats are prepping an amicus brief to file in this appeals court, mm -hmm. which is going to move really fast. Uh, and so, um, as a result, this is going to be a live issue. So as much as I think Republicans might try to pivot away from this, it's, it's going to be something that will continue to loom over this next election. And they can only blame themselves for it. They handpick the judges and justices who are delivering these decisions in a harmful way, right? We have, we have the judge down in Texas. We also have the Supreme Court justices they handpicked who overturned Roe v. Wade and will likely be hearing this Ms. Pristone case once it advances. But there's things going on in the states that I'm not sure we anticipated. Sure. I mean, it, it's gone a little bit further than most of the Republicans and Republican Main Street Partnership ever thought it would, mm. even though they are 100% uh, pro-life. I want to talk about Tennessee, but before we move on, Sarah, I'm curious, have you seen any evidence of Republicans actually shifting their messaging? Particularly when you look at the polls, this is an issue that voters across the spectrum care about. However yep. you stand on it, people are fired up by this issue. Absolutely, and we're actually having meetings when the members get back around this issue. Because they're beginning, especially at Main Street, because we are the majority makers, we're beginning to realize we need to talk about women's health care okay. and get off of just talking about abortion. Okay, so you're saying this is something we should expect Absolutely. to see. Okay, interesting. Let's talk about Tennessee. Vice President Harris was in Tennessee after those two uh, lawmakers were expelled. Juanita, are you starting to see Vice President Harris, particularly as you see Republicans coalesce around potentially making 2024 about her, mm. she's starting to find her voice as vice president in a yes. different way? In a different moment. way. I feel like her trip to the continent of Africa gave her confidence, and then she mm -hmm. quickly went to Nashville. And I grew up in Shelby County, Tennessee, just for folks who didn't know. So I know the treatment 
what it's like in that state. So hearing her say that turning off the mics and trying to shut down the people who are speaking about democracy, speaking about their rights, is the problem. And I appreciate her going down there so quickly to be so vocal mm -hmm. about this because this is a ripe opportunity for her to carve out a path that a lot of people have criticized her for the past mm -hmm. two years that she hadn't done yet. So she's planting a flag on this issue in particular. Let me play what Asa Hutchinson had to say about this and get everyone's reaction on the other side. I don't think that uh, uh, you know every national leader needs to comment on what's happening in Tennessee. You know, if uh, if it becomes a national issue and concern, yes. But uh, I view this as something that uh, is a Tennessee legislative issue. It's obviously a very serious thing. Anytime you uh, take uh, the elected representative away from the people who voted for them, it's a most serious consequence that you can have. I just can't judge right now. Nicholas Asa Hutchinson, presidential candidate, is do you think that uh, is sustainable to say, oh, it's just a Tennessee issue when the entire country's been talking about it? It's kind of a risky lane for him to take as, as a presidential candidate when so much of the conversation around this really has been about national issue of, of gun uh, gun safety and gun and, and gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, that that has you know it, it, it's always talked about in Congress. It's not just a state issue. Mm -hmm. So, Sarah, but for me, thoughts? I realize this is around guns and everything. But this goes back to gerrymandered districts and people not voting in primaries. If you voted in primaries, you may have different representation. That is what we have to start doing in this. Country. But do you think what happened in Tennessee could have reverberations, could have a backlash Certainly for could. Republicans nationwide? Certainly could. It okay. was wrong and we should have done it. All right, guys. Great conversation. Appreciate it, Nicholas, Juanita, and Sarah. Thank you all for being here. After the break, Nashville officials are now poised to reinstate one of the two black Tennessee lawmakers we were just talking about who was expelled by Republicans for participating in a demonstration inside the State House on gun reform. We will delve into that. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. You are looking live at Nashville, where just moments from now, the Nashville Metropolitan Council is set to vote on a new representative for the state legislature. And a majority of council members tell NBC News they'll vote to reappoint Justin Jones. Republican legislatures voted last week to expel Jones and now former state representative Justin Pearson, both of whom are black days after leading a protest on the House floor calling for stricter gun laws. A third lawmaker who is white was not expelled. Pearson described the environment at the Tennessee State House as toxic yesterday on Meet the Press. It has always been a toxic work environment to work in the Tennessee State Capitol. When you have people who make comments about hanging you on a tree and hanging black people on a tree as a form of capital punishment. When you wear a dashiki on the House floor and a member gets up and they talk about your dashiki saying it's unprofessional, they're really sending signals that you don't belong here. I'm joined now by Van Turner, president of the Memphis branch of the NAACP. Mr. Turner, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So what message does today's vote send, do you think, not just to the people of Tennessee, but nationwide? Well, I think this is an important vote by the Metro Council in Nashville and here in Shelby County, there'll be another vote for Pearson on this Wednesday. And I think the message is, is that this country is premised upon the fact that if you have a grievance to redress, if you have an issue you're able to voice that opinion without consequences. It's what separates us from other uh, countries. And so we go all around the world fighting for democracy, fighting for the First Amendment, fighting for those who have been jailed and killed for speaking out. Yet we have the expulsion of these two representatives here who were expelled for speaking out and speaking out for a good cause, a righteous mm -hmm. cause, a cause uh, that we all I know is an issue here in this country, and that's the issue of gun violence. Mm. Well, you know, Pearson, as we just played, described the work environment as toxic. Um, what do you make of that? And could this moment be the moment where change starts to happen? It needs to happen. And I listened very closely to what Representative Pearson indicated. Uh, they would call the question on debates to end debates early. They would cut the mics off. They wouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not allowing these representatives to have their full time to speak on the issues. And the reason that the Tennessee Three went to the well 
and protested was there was no transparent deliberation over gun laws here in the state of Tennessee. Mm. And and their mics were being cut off and their voices were being cut off. So they had to go to the well to speak out and to speak up. And so it, it was almost an issue where they were forced to do it. So hopefully going forward, as representatives Jones and Pearson are reappointed, mm. we will see a change in the Tennessee General Assembly. There needs to be a change. And hopefully we'll see that going forward. The House Speaker there basically said, look, this had nothing to do with race. This is because these lawmakers violated the rules by protesting on the floor and essentially a breach of decorum because they used a bullhorn. What do you make of that argument? Is there any validity there? No, nah, no. Nah. And, and there were instances that were uh, uh, given the evening of the expulsion about representatives uh, coming to, to blows, uh, you know, fighting on the floor. Uh, issues where some representatives had their lives threatened. Issues where one representative mm. wore a Confederate um, uh, tie and he was not asked to take the tie off. And that's in direct uh, uh, contradiction to the American flag and what we all stand for and what they took an oath to protect. And so they were not uh, reprimanded. They were not uh, expelled. Mm. And so here, uh, this seems to be a selective prosecution uh, situation. These representatives were sought out. They were expelled. I called it a political lynching. Uh, the majority, if only one of the members of the Republican Party in the assembly is non-white. Most are white men. And so you see what occurred uh, on that floor. We all saw it. And so I, I don't buy it. Uh, race was definitely a part of what we saw. And hopefully the world will see. We can no longer again go to Ukraine. We can't go across this world fighting for democracy. We, we we talk about Putin and we talk about all the evils of these uh, dictatorships and of all these countries that are, are doing these horrible things to their citizens. Yet in our own backyard, we see what has played out in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it's a wake up call for Speaker Sexton and the rest of the Tennessee General Assembly. We, we can't have this going forward and, and hopefully we won't see this going forward. OK, well, we will leave it there uh, with those comments. We will watch both votes very closely. Van Turner, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Still to come, U.S.-China tensions are on the rise as Beijing orders military drills and attack simulations around Taiwan after top U.S. lawmakers met with the island's president. We have new reporting from on the ground in Taipei next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. China says they have now completed their military exercises and war readiness patrols around the island of Taiwan. Those military drills coming on the heels of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's meeting with Taiwan's president in California. The three days of exercises include a massive show of force by Chinese military planes and vessels around the self-governing island, as well as military simulations. For days, the White House had tried to downplay this meeting between Speaker McCarthy and the president of Taiwan, insisting there was no reason for China to respond. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby is in Taipei with more. Kristen, today marked China's largest show of military force since these three days of military exercises here near Taiwan began. Now, the past several days, every day there has been a headline out of these exercises. Today, it was a record-breaking number of Chinese aircraft and ships, 91 aircraft that flew near the island here in Taiwan, and 12 Chinese warships that surrounded the island. In both cases, this was the Chinese military demonstrating that they can cut off supplies, movement in and out by both air and sea for Taiwan. Yesterday, we had a separate headline, the Chinese military simulating missile strikes 
in and around Taiwan from air, land and sea with a Chinese military animation that was released that seemed to show one of the strikes hitting here in the capital city of Taipei. Now, these three days of exercises are in response to a series of high level talks that occurred between American and Taiwanese officials beginning last week with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who met with Taiwanese President Tsai in California. Only hours later, a bipartisan delegation arrived here in Taipei for three days of meetings with the vice president, the speaker of the house here, and then with the president just freshly back from her transit across the U.S. The exercises are not new. When House, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was here in Taipei last summer, China unleashed an unprecedented military exercise that even included firing ballistic missiles over Taiwan. These exercises have been less intense than what we saw there. U.S. officials saying it's most likely because the speaker's meeting was in California and not here in Taiwan. But that being said, these three days of military war games have not been insignificant. Taiwan initially vowing to remain calm and monitor them on Saturday. But by Sunday, they were show doing their own readiness drills, showing their air defense capabilities, moving troops around. Today, they said they will continue to monitor the Chinese military activities in the area for the foreseeable future. Kristen. All right, Courtney QB in Taiwan for us. Courtney, thank you so much, and thank you for being with us this hour. I'm back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. Before we go, be sure to sign up for our free daily newsletter, First Read. You'll get the best analysis, polling, and political news every morning. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to nbcnews.com slash First Read. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now.